New research suggests that flu vaccines could actually help to prevent Alzheimer's. But our question today as we dive into this study is, how effective are they? And how do they measure up to other well-known preventative measures like eating healthier, getting enough sleep, and going out and getting some exercise? Well, you are about to find out. Emerum Live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We appreciate you raising your health IQ with us in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And it is, in fact, Alzheimer's Day here on the program, and we're looking at ways that you can lower your risk and diving into new research just out that appears to show that people who receive routine vaccinations, including for the flu, have a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's. So taking us inside this research today is best-selling author, president of the Physicians Committee, our dear friend, Dr. Neil Barnard. And our goal today, not just to crunch those particular numbers, but of course also to examine how these other efforts that you can take, like we mentioned, more sleep, eating healthier, getting exercise, how these vaccinations compare to those methods as well. We're getting into all the research. We're going to shake all of that out. And Dr. Barnard, just back from a conference with the American Medical Association, where there could be a seismic shift in the way that the medical community is viewing these major factory farms. You may know them as CAFOs. Well, doctors are now saying these massive feats of agriculture are actually harmful for your health and as well as harmful to the environment and, of course, the animals. So some strong sentiments coming from a leading health organization that we're going to be diving into momentarily and also opening up the doctor's mailbag, which means your questions will be answered. And if there's a question you have for Dr. Barnard, go ahead, drop it in the doctor's mailbag, put it in the comments or in the chat and we will get to as many as we can on the show today so let's not waste any more time let's welcome dr barnard to the program so we can get this exciting show on the way how you doing dr barnard good to see you doing great chuck great to see you too uh, first of all, welcome back from the conference, even though it was just across the border from Washington in Maryland. Uh, but I'm glad that you're back after a couple of days out of the office and you come back at a really exciting time with this new research that was splashed across headlines worldwide uh, talking about Alzheimer's. Now, first of all, Dr. Barnard, correct me if I'm wrong, Alzheimer's affects nearly 7 million people in the U.S. and something like 55 million worldwide. Is that is that about right? Yes, it's very, very common. It's common worldwide. And if you made a list of all the diseases you don't want to get, Alzheimer's has got to be at the top of the list because you, you lose everything. You lose everyone who ever mattered to you. And up until, oh, I don't know, I would say maybe around the year 2000, there was virtually no hope for any, there was no hope of preventing it at all. But since that time, we've been looking at diet, we've been looking at exercise, lifestyle issues. And Chuck, you said uh, the, the latest thing, which is, could vaccines actually influence Alzheimer's risk? The answer appears to be yes. Mm. Now, I, I, now will, I will say that I, this I is going to be a sensitive be a topic sensitive for topic a lot of people, um, but it's also an important one because the facts are out there and, and we just need to have this conversation so that people can make an informed and educated decision. Um, let's talk about these two studies. I know one came out last year, another one came out this year, and the article that first caught my eye was in the Washington Post, and it looked at, uh, I mean, really, particularly with the flu vaccine, which is the latest research, came out, and we're talking about over a million people, close to two million people were, were tracked for this study. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's right. And, and backing up to what you said earlier, Chuck, I think it's really important to emphasize vaccines, like all drugs, they have benefits and they have risks. And so different people come out in, in different ways of, of weighing those things. Um, and so it's important to just have the facts and, and see what, what uh, we can can understand with them. Um, with regard to this, this uh, new study, uh, flu vaccines have been around for a long period of time. There have been many of them, and they, like others, have benefits and they have risks. And a lot of people um, have thought, why should I bother? Um, the flu is not such, such a big deal and so forth. And uh, this new uh, research suggests that not only having the flu vaccine does it reduce Alzheimer's risk, which is a little bit of a, a puzzle. Why should that be? 
but more importantly, perhaps having it every year for, it, it seems to be better than having had it once 10 years ago with regard to reducing Alzheimer's risk. What is it specifically about getting it repeatedly that they found here? Because I believe that with the study, they looked at people for up to eight years. So when it comes to getting it in consecutive years, what exactly did they see here? Well, the reduce, if you've gotten it a couple of times, your, your Alzheimer's risk has dropped by about 20%. That's a good thing. That's, that's striking. But if you've had it more frequently than that, the, the risk reduction could be as much as 40%. And that certainly gets your attention. But the other question, though, is what the heck is, is this about? Um, and there are a number of possibilities. One is it could just be a chance finding that isn't real, that isn't related to the vaccine. Uh, more likely is that it either has something to do with either the virus, uh, because we've known that inflammatory processes can be triggered by viruses and the inflammatory processes, processes can work in the brain. The alternative theory is uh -uh, it doesn't have to do with, with particularly just knocking out that virus. It has to do with the way a vaccine affects your immune system in general, and it makes it more vigilant against other infections maybe perhaps apart from the flu virus and that could benefit so it's it, it could be the effect on the virus it could be the at a more general effect on the immune system independent of this specific virus so let me ask you this the amyloid plaques that are believed to build up in the brain those are kind of the hallmarks of alzheimer's disease are we thinking then that these vaccines actually kind of view those plaques as foreign invaders and that that triggers the immune response and they go in there and they attack the, the plaque. Is that what's going on here theoretically? That, that's a really good way of putting it. It, it. And it should be pointed out that in some ways, this is not an entirely new finding. Do, Dr. Alzheimer himself, uh, for whom the disease is named, uh, a century ago, give or take, um, not only identified the plaques, but also suggested that this could have an infective uh, uh, component to its being caused. Uh, could a virus or bacterium contribute to it? And just what you said is what is one of the mechanisms that people are, are looking at for the efficacy of the vaccine. I should, by the way, mention that it's not only the influenza vaccine, that's the one that, that we're looking at at the moment, but people have looked at also, if you get a shingles vaccine, if you get a DPT shot, that's the, the diphtheria and pertussis and tetanus shot that a lot of people are familiar with, or just the pneumonia vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine, that in addition to the influenza vaccine, all of these seem in, in other studies seem to have been associated with a substantial reduction in risk and how much, call it about a 30% drop in the risk of getting Alzheimer's. Yeah, let's look at these numbers. I went through and I, I pulled them out and it's it's really striking. As you said just a, a moment ago, uh, specific, we'll start with the flu vaccine here, Dr. Barnard. Uh, if you get that for three consecutive years, they found this in a group of people 65 and up. Matter of fact, I think that's consistent, that age demographic for all of the studies we're going to be talking about, 65 and up. Three consecutive years, 20% lower risk, four years to eight years, which was the length of that uh, study in its entirety, 40% lower risk. That's a pretty big drop. But as you said, not just limited to flu. The shingles vaccine study there looked at nearly 200,000 people, uh, found out that of those who developed Alzheimer's disease, there were 5,000 fewer who had received the shingles vaccine. So you're looking at 16,000 who got Alzheimer's uh, who were vaccinated versus 21,000 who got it that did not have the vaccine. Uh, the Tdap. Uh, again, 116,000 people, 3,500 fewer of those who were vaccinated developed dementia. And then the pneumococcal vaccination, 260, so about a quarter million people involved in that study, 8,000 fewer vaccinated versus unvaccinated. You're talking about 20,000 uh, who had it versus 28, almost 29,000 uh, who did not. Um, medically speaking, I want to use the term statistically significant. Uh, it seems like those are pretty big differences. Would you call those statistically significant, meaning that it's really hard to ignore the data as it is? Yeah, the, the, clearly. Um, they're statistically significant, meaning this is, this is not just chance. This isn't just random variation or very unlikely. It's, it's, it's a real thing. And then the question is, is it clinically significant? Does it matter? Does it matter if you have 20 or 30 or 40 percent less risk of Alzheimer's? Um, and the answer is yes, it, it's clinically significant, too. But then there's another thing that, that Chuck, you, you and I have been, been talking about a little bit is could this be all 
could this perhaps not be the result of the vaccine, but the result of a health conscious person goes to get the vaccine because they think that's what they ought to be doing. But they're also doing other things that reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, like exercising, following a healthy diet, and maybe the vaccine is irrelevant. And I think that's a really important consideration. It can't be totally ruled out. That said, the investors, did, the investigators did everything they could to control for that. You control for level of education. You control. You can control to an extent for these other lifestyle factors, and still you do see this effect. But I don't. I don't think they ruled that out entirely. And 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 that's an important thing because diet, dietary factors, we've talked about on this show before, play a huge role. In fact, even a bigger role. Uh, percentage-wise than the, these numbers we're talking about for vaccines, dietary factors can have a huge effect with Alzheimer's disease. Absolutely. So let's let's unpack this a little bit and see if we can crunch some numbers here. So let's take these vaccination studies and set them aside for a second. And let's talk about lowering the risk of Alzheimer's by strictly the dietary method, uh, the getting enough sleep, you know, going out there, lacing up the sneakers, as you like to say, going for a run, going for a walk, just getting some exercise, you know, do is it able for us to quantify how much somebody can lower the risk just by taking those more holistic methods? We can we can talk in rough numbers. Um, some of the best data I think came from the Chicago Health and Aging Project, and these were published back in two thousand three. This is our dear friend Martha Claire Morris and her team at Rush University did brilliant data, and what they looked at was number one saturated fat. That's the fat that's in dairy, the fat that's in meat, the fat that's in bacon. People who tend to avoid that fat living in Chicago, neighbors with all the people who liked bacon, um, those people who tended to avoid it had a risk of developing Alzheimer's that was, oh, rough, call it about two thirds reduced, call it 60%, something like that reduced. It the, the, the exact figure depends on how you do the data, but, but that's a good uh, number. Uh, another thing, vitamin E. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. It's in nuts, it's in seeds, it's in green vegetables, it's in mangoes. Lots of plant foods have vitamin E. People who neglect it have about double the risk of Alzheimer's. You put that the other way around. If you have a lot of vitamin E in your diet, your risk of Alzheimer's is cut by about half, if the numbers of, that we see in Chicago apply to you. And then researchers have looked at exercise. Exercise plays a role. Getting adequate sleep plays a role when you are unconscious. Your brain turns down its production of beta amyloid. Um, so if, you, if I were to put all this together and you were to ask me to come up with a number, I would say that a healthy diet and lifestyle, if you really put it together, could probably reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease somewhere on the order of 70 to 80 percent. Now, that's an estimate. It would have to be tested. But I think it's pretty good, uh, a pretty good ballpark. So it beats vaccines a lot, but um, it's not one or the other. You can do right. both and they're probably additive. Right. And and it, it goes back to what it was we were talking about before. You know, if, if we've got buckets that we can assign everybody to, you know, what are the odds that somebody's going to fall into the bucket who is eating a lot of vitamin C, who is an avid ex exerciser, goes to bed at 10 o'clock, gets up uh, eight hours later, quality shut eye. You know, what are the odds that that health minded individual, that health conscious individual is also the one who's first in line to get these vaccines you know not everybody is going to fit into one bucket again we realize that as we're having this conversation no question about it but my gut tells me just based off of my 41 plus years on earth that there's a number of people who will be fitting into both of those buckets wouldn't you say yeah absolutely and then there's another consideration obviously you can get tested to see if you have the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. That's a gene you get from your mom and your dad. And if you got it from one parent, your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, all other things being equal, is tripled. If you got it from both parents, both your mom and your dad gave you the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. This is the one that increases risk. Your risk of Alzheimer's is 10 to 15 times higher. So people have thought of that as sort of uh, a death sentence, if you've, if you've got that. However, uh, researchers have found that even people at genetic risk, if they make diet and lifestyle changes, the data suggest that their risk of Alzheimer's is changed dramatically, which, which is good because I mean, that's what we saw with diabetes. You can have diabetes up and all up and down your family, but you can still reduce your risk dramatically. And Chuck, uh, at the press club, you were talking with uh, Caldwell Esselstyn and his family. 
talking about uh, what looked like bad genetic risk in their family. Uh, they uh, heart disease all up and down the family tree. But what did they do? They changed their diet and lifestyle. They did not change their genes, but they dramatically changed their risk. So let's apply that to Alzheimer's disease. My best guess is that although you don't want the ApoE epsilon four alleles, but if that's the cards that you're dealt, uh, if we follow a healthful lifestyle, diet, uh, vegan diet, plant-based diet, keep the saturated fat to an absolute minimum, uh, exercise and stay healthy, that you too can greatly reduce your risk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is, it's an exciting time, I think, to be in our field, Dr. Barnard, because I feel like in a lot of ways, and I was talking to Julie about this before we went on the air, my wife, and I said, Jules, I, what, what really excites me about this is, is not just that I feel like we're making great strides in the right direction to solve a lot of these mysteries, but we're literally trying to unpack millions of years of, of evolution and human biology and science. And the level that we've been able to do that within the past 50, 60, even 100 years is just incredible the way that all of this research has accelerated and our knowledge and our understanding has just vastly expanded. And so I would be really curious in another 100 years to see just how far we've come. And you've been at this a long time yourself, not 100 years, not trying to age you, but certainly, I mean, it's got to be really kind of exciting for you still to see just how far we have come, right? Yes, we've come a long way. But I have to say, Chuck, things continue to also get more complicated in some ways. We saw this with COVID. You know, the whole idea is uh, if you get an infection, you're going to get a disease. And if you get a disease, you'll live, or you'll die, whatever. But it turned out with COVID, it wasn't just whether you inhaled that virus. If you happen to be overweight and you got it, if you happen to have diabetes and you got it, you, you are more likely to have symptoms from that virus. You are more likely to die from that virus. That is probably the case with the Alzheimer's issues as well, that let's say there may be a role for viruses or even bacterial toxins that could play a role in the neurodegeneration that we call Alzheimer's disease, that it's not necessarily just the infective microbe. It's also the qualities of the host, the diet that you're following, the exercise that you're following. So what do you want? Do you want to do what you can to repel the viruses and bacteria? Sure. Um, do you want to follow a healthy lifestyle? Sure. You want, to, you want to get as many of the assets on your side as you possibly can. That said, uh, there are no risks of a healthful diet. There are risks of vaccines. There are risks of pharmaceuticals. So we have to look at those and keep our eyes open. All right. Now let's dive into uh, the specific assets in the dietary portfolio first. You had mentioned uh, pros here. Nuts, seeds, greafy, uh, lean, greafy, boy, I can't talk today. Leafy green vegetables, things with vitamin E. What are some other foods that we know that can help really lower that risk? Okay. One of the really key things is to avoid certain bad things. Let's say you have liver or you have red meat, the kind of stuff that I grew up with as a kid in North Dakota. We thought that these iron rich foods were helpful, but researchers have shown that if you get too much iron, which is really easy to do on an American diet, that increases the risk. If you have too much copper, that increases the risk. Aluminum seems to increase the risk as well. So if we think about food-wise, where are these metals? Uh, the, 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 the excess iron is in, as I mentioned, red meat, it's in uh, animal products in general, uh, red meat uh, and also uh, liver, but also in the cookware that you cooked it with, your favorite cast iron pan, if you're using it as your go-to pan every day, you're absorbing iron from that source. Uh, copper is not only in, in animal products as well, uh, but you'll get copper from your copper pipes. So the water's been sitting in your copper pipes all night long, and then in the morning you, you uh, filled your coffee maker or something like that. There you go. Uh, aluminum is in a lot of things, unfortunately. Your body has no desire for it, no biological use for, for aluminum at all, but it's, it's an additive. It's used in a number of foods, unfortunately, and it's in some some medications like Maalox, for example. What about things like uh, deodorant? We have an exam roomie by the name of Holly who was wondering about that one specifically. How big of a concern might that be? It's an, impo it's an important concern. If, if what you're using is a deodorant, period, it does not have aluminum in it. If it is an antiperspirant, if it says something about perspiration on the label, 
flip it around, look at the, at the ingredients and you'll very likely see aluminum in it. Is it transmitted through the skin? Yes, it is. So set that aside. If you, you have to do a little bit of searching on the, on the drugstore shelves, but you will see ones that do not have aluminum in them. And it, for my money, I would choose those. And back to the foods here, um, talking about things to avoid though, but what about, you know, we always go back to the standard American diet and go into the drive through And so if I close my eyes, I can just picture a greasy double cheeseburger, large fries, orange soda to drink with that. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I mean, maybe there's aluminum in there with the cookware, but um, metals aside, how damaging is that high fat, fast food, ultra processed diet in terms of a person's Alzheimer's risk? It's terrible. As bad as, bad as it is for your heart, it's that bad for your brain. In fact, researchers at Kaiser Permanente a number of years ago looked at uh, high cholesterol levels. And we all know what pops your cholesterol level up. A meaty, cheesy diet, or also the tropical oils like coconut oil and palm oil. Um, if your diet contains a lot of those and your cholesterol level rises, that high cholesterol level alone is going to increase your long-term risk of Alzheimer's disease. So what's good for your heart, it's good for your brain, it's good for your heart to avoid uh, avoid the meats and the dairy products. All right. And, and we have another question here, and it's if unfortunately somebody is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, is there a way to kind of pump the brakes on its progression so that it's not a really quick process that you can really slow it down and make sure that you're still getting some quality days out of your life? Dean Ornish is actually doing that very study right now. Uh, and the, the results have not yet been published, uh, but I'm very, very eager. Uh, for that publication to happen. What, what uh, Dr. Ornish did is just as he did in his heart study where he, a generation ago, looked at people who had existing heart disease. And at that point, it's, it's not prevention, it's reversal. He put people on a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, daily half hour walk, reducing stress. Uh, and he showed that you could reverse heart disease to, to a dramatic degree. So his current study is related to cognitive difficulties, people with Alzheimer's disease in the early stages, and we'll see what the results suggest. Uh, all the hints are that it should be helpful. Uh, there, was, uh, there have been a number of studies on people who have this sort of what we call an early stage of dementia called mild cognitive impairment. Many of these cases do progress to be Alzheimer's, although not all, and researchers have shown that in these people, if you do various uh, diet and lifestyle interventions, uh, at the University of Cincinnati, they looked at uh, anthocyanin-rich foods. Anthocyanins are the blue and purple colors in grapes and in blueberries. Uh, take about a pint of blueberry juice or a pint of grape juice, just straight off the, the grocery shelf. That, in, that improved cognition in people who already had the beginnings of cognitive impairment. Researchers at the University of Illinois brought in about 120 adults and got them exercising to a rather modest degree, three times a week, 40 minute brisk walk. And that improved their cognition as well. And it gets better. They then scanned their brains and found that the hippocampus, which is the, the part of the brain that is the seat of memory uh, and, and has been shrinking in a lot of people, it actually started uh, the shrinkage was reversed in these people, just with a rather modest uh, exercise regimen. So the short answer is in the early stages of cognitive decline, it does seem like diet and lifestyle can help. Can't wait for Dr. Ornish's uh, study. However, in advanced Alzheimer's disease, the brain cells are lost. The brain is shrinking. And I would be very surprised if the advanced stages of Alzheimer's, I, I'd be surprised if diet and lifestyle could really help there. Nonetheless, I think that, you know, catching it early, and, and we've heard this with a lot of diseases, you know, your, your odds are much, much, much improved the earlier you catch these things so that hopefully then with Alzheimer's and, and dementia, if, if you're still in that MCI, that mild cognitive impairment phase, as you were saying, you go through these steps, you make these changes. 
I mean, it looks like there's some pretty promising findings there. So, you know, knock on wood uh, that we, we continue down that, that healthier path there so that we do get the findings that we're hoping for, um, certainly so that we can kind of stop this thing early, nip it in the bud, as they like to say. Um, really quickly before oh, we open. No, sure. Yeah. Just, just one, 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 other, one other point on this um, that sure. you kind of touched on. Um, the, the mind diet. Um, this was developed by Martha Claire Morris and her team at Rush University as uh, sort of a compromise diet uh, to see if what if I do a combination of a Mediterranean diet, which is, you know, some fish and olive oil and combine that with a DASH diet, which is developed to fight hypertension, sort of the same kind of thing. And they showed over time it actually was not effective in reducing the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. So that suggests to me that what I'm gonna call halfway measures, moving from beef to getting your meat from fish, not enough of a change. Uh, the, 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 the intervention that I would suggest needs to be explored is one that doesn't have animal products in it at all, not a drop of animal fat, no cholesterol, and have the foods that you're eating be the healthy, healthy foods, the vegetables, fruits, whole grains and beans. Halfway measures, not enough. And uh, let's kind of put a bow on this in terms of exercise and sleep. Uh, first, with sleep, um, the data right now, does it show about eight hours is that sweet spot for really lowering the risk of Alzheimer's disease? Yes, but, the, you know, the more sleep you get, the better. Um, and, and I have to say, once people are 60, 65, so, so few of them are sleeping eight hours a night, they're, they're uh for whatever reason, they say, you know, I wake up at five o'clock and I feel ready to, to meet the day. Uh, but win the lottery so you don't have worries in your life. You know, uh, make sure that you're getting some exercise so that you're tired when you lie down and do get as much sleep as you can. And what about that exercise? How much do you recommend here for lowering the Alzheimer's risk? Well, at the University of Illinois, what they said is three times a week, 40 minute brisk walk. And a brisk walk means walking fast enough that your pulse is increasing but not so fast that you can't speak. Okay, 40 minute brisk walk three times a week. That's effective. For my money, you can exercise more than 40 minutes three times a week. So I would encourage people to exercise as much as they can. And if you wanna pick up the pace and go running, fair enough. Uh, be careful with your joints, make sure that you, you're safe. But to tell you the truth, your body thrives the more you get your heart beating. All right. Let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag, get some questions from the exam roomies who are joining us live. Thanks to everybody who's hanging out. Mona, Kelly, Sherry, Joan. Uh, we celebrate eating plants is this person's particular name. Uh, they are in Tulsa right now. Um, so just great to have everybody here with us worldwide and, and joining us. And if you're watching this on demand or you're hearing the podcast every Wednesday, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on the Physicians Committee's YouTube channel and Facebook page, that's where you can join us live and get your questions answered on the spot. So go ahead and set that reminder in your calendar. And if you're watching this live, hey, bonus points to you for liking this video and subscribing to the channel right now. Um, Joan, Dr. Barnard is wondering with these uh, studies that we were talking about in terms of vaccinations, has anybody been able to look at the COVID vaccine yet and whether or not that may have any effect on Alzheimer's risk? $64,000 question, what will COVID do too early? Um, because keep in mind, the vaccines really just came out, what, 2021, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. So we haven't had enough time to follow courts to see who gets Alzheimer's and who doesn't. But stay tuned. My money is that it will have an effect, um, just because we've seen it so consistently with every other vaccine. Um, and SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus you're attacking, does affect cognition. Um, so the, the our presumption is that that is a virus that does cause neuroinflammatory processes and the vaccines are going to help and may have a more um, general effect uh, of, of Alzheimer's prevention in addition to that. But let me stress, you know, vaccines have pluses and minuses. There are risks uh, of them as well. And so I think researchers need to be attentive to both. All right. We were talking about mild cognitive impairment and Darlene is kind of wondering, well, might I already have that? Her question, does walking into a room and forgetting what you went in there for or even a movie star's name indicate that you are getting dementia she says that she's only 66 years old so when should we become concerned dr barnard the examples that you've 
described are really very common and they happen at any age. Uh, uh, people will, will very often let a name slip or a, a movie title slip or they, they walk upstairs, they can't remember why that happened. Uh, what really matters is how often does that occur. If it's once in a while, we call it normal. Uh, if it happens particularly when you are sleep deprived, stressed, thinking about other things, totally normal. If it's happening every day throughout the day, then it's not normal. And it's a good time to talk with your doctor because y your doctor knows that there are treatable things that could be causing this. The most common is some medication that you might be taking. It could be uh, aggravating it. The doctor wants to look through your medications, stop or reduce or change uh, your regimen. The doctor will also look at B12 levels, vitamin B12. Um, you don't want to be low in vitamin B12, easy to prevent. Your doctor will look at your thyroid function and other things to make sure that the treatable causes of cognitive issues are all being addressed. Melinda has a question. Do you need omega-3 supplements if you're eating a whole food, plant-based, SOS-free diet? So no salt, oil, or sugar. Man, they're eating clean, Dr. Barnard. So do they still need to worry about an omega-3 supplement? Uh, great question and a controversial one. Um, you do need omega-3 in your diet. And there is one omega-3 oil that is naturally in foods. It's in, in plants. It's called alpha-linolenic acid. And your body takes that from broccoli or asparagus or nuts or wherever you got it. There, there are traces of it in many, many plant foods. And your body will then use that and build the other omega-3s from it. That process of lengthening it and building the other omega-3s is a slow one. And it's made even slower by fatty foods, uh, other fatty foods that, that uh, interfere with the enzyme's ability to work. So most people nowadays would say, have a lot of green vegetables in your diet. They don't have a lot of fat in them, but the fat they have is heavily weighted toward omega-3. You can have other omega-3 sources like chia seeds and, and many seeds and nuts have this alpha-linolenic acid in them. That's great, but don't leave it there. Avoid a lot of the competing fats. So if you're not having a lot of salad oils and a lot of greasy French fries that tie up those enzymes that your body needs to lengthen those healthy fats, well, getting away from those competing fats is a good idea too. Beyond that, uh, should you take a, a supplement? Well, the good news is there are vegan omega-3 supplements. They have DHA and EPA, just like in fish oil, but they're from plants. Um, you go online and you look up vegan DHA, vegan EPA, they've got them. But uh, studies have shown that people who supplement with DHA and EPA from fish oils in particular, um, I don't know if these studies have been done with the vegan ones, but I suspect the results would be the same. Uh, people with very high intake of omega-3 have, for men, higher risk of prostate cancer. When that first came out, we thought, wait, stop. You have a really high intake of omega-3. Why would that increase your risk of prostate cancer? And no one has ever answered that. No one has figured that out. In fact, we thought it was just a fluke when these findings came out, but it's been fairly consistent. So the question now is, oh, gee, should a person take these supplements or not? Bottom line, a healthy diet that has natural sources of omega-3 is a good idea. If you supplement, there, most of the benefits of omega-3 haven't really panned out very, uh, very well. But the one that people worry about is, is if I'm really low in omega-3, could I have a higher risk for Alzheimer's? Don't know the answer. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say on this is you can test. There are companies like Omega Quant, where if you send them something like 50 bucks, they'll send you a little test kit and you prick your finger and you put a drop of blood on a little circle. You send it to them and a couple weeks later, they send you your result. Here's your DHA level now. Here's your EPA level now. And then you, if you want to, you can decide to supplement and get tested again and then some months later and, and see if you're improving. Or if you already have a robust level, you don't bother. So I leave it to you if you want to go those uh, in the, those directions. But that's sort of the state of the science right now. Just Eat Plants says that they are snacking on roasted soybeans and watching the program today over lunch. So pretty cool. Thanks for being here. A uh, lot of protein in soy, Dr. Barnard, which brings us to a question from Maria, who is wondering whether excessive protein in the diet can actually affect plaque buildup in the brain. Do we have a connection there? 
Probably not. Um, at least all the data that I've seen would say no. Uh, the, the big driver here seems to be fat content of the diet, particularly saturated fat and trans fats. Trans fats have been to a great degree removed from the diet, but there are natural traces, natural traces of trans fats in dairy products and in also, also in meat. So if you ever wanted another reason to avoid those foods, you got it. Uh, but the protein, probably not a driver. Um, if it is animal protein, animal protein is accompanied by animal fat. You don't want that. Christine, how much do environmental toxins increase Alzheimer's risk? So we've talked about things like aluminum cookware and cast iron skillets, uh, but what about some other environmental hazards that we might want to avoid? You know, that's actually where this whole thing started. It was uh, the, with aluminum. It wasn't looking at foil and, and um, cookware. It was looking at water. Uh, and in England, researchers discovered that people whose the water out of the tap, uh, in some counties it had more aluminum in it and in other counties, less aluminum. The counties in England with more water in their, uh, more aluminum in their drinking water had about a 50% higher risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to the others. So those findings were then corroborated elsewhere and that led researchers to looking into aluminum's role as a neurotoxin. So that's the big one. Um, there are lots of other pollutants in in the water, in the air. For the most part, they haven't really been identified as, as being linked to, to Alzheimer's. The, the big ones really are the metals that we're concerned about. Let's take a couple more questions before we get to the, the big topic of conversation for a lot of people at the AMA conference recently. Um, let's start with one from Linda. And this is an interesting one that I think a lot of people probably can't distinguish between the two. And she's wondering, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia, Dr. Barnard? Oh, thank you for asking that. You know, I should have mentioned that at the top of the show because I think it's easy to get hung up on that. Dementia means that you're losing cognitive function. And that can mean your ability to remember things, your ability to take on new knowledge, or even such things as your ability to control your emotions uh, or, or to keep your personality stable, um, your ability to think abstractly or to draw a, a face or a clock and have the pieces in the right, right uh, order. All of those cognitive functions can degrade, and when they do, that's dementia. Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia. There are a number of different types. For example, you could have a stroke, where, I hope you don't, but a person has a stroke and they can lose cognitive function. For that reason, Alzheimer's is a particular type of dementia, and it's manifested by us, what are called tau proteins, in the brain cells and also these beta amyloid plaques in between the brain cells. And final question here it comes to us from Coastal Dream sent this one in on Instagram. Not sure that I've seen a study on this one in particular, perhaps you have. Does soda increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, Dr. Barnard? Uh, the so well, probably not the soda itself. I mean, what is a soda? It's water, it's high fructose corn syrup and a whole bunch of flavorings and maybe some caffeine. Um, all those things have issues of their own, but with regards to Alzheimer's disease, probably not. But uh, the big question in my mind has been the soda can, uh, because at, we were mentioning aluminum as being a driver for this. Now there's a coating in it. Um, and the, I, let me tell you, the soda industry will say, no relation, don't worry about it. That aluminum can is not leaching aluminum into your soda. Well, it is. Um, the studies show that it does. The question is, does the rather trivial amount of aluminum that comes out of the can, gets into the soda, is that enough to cause a problem? The soda industry would say no. What I would say is get a bottle, have it be Perrier, have it be just fizzy water straight from France, and you're going to be better off. Fizzy water straight. It's got to be the French kind of fizzy water. No other kind will do. Um, well, San Pellegrino for my Italian friends, sure. There there you go. Um, and, and, you know, I think that there, there are a couple of people right now in the chat who are watching live, Dr. Barnard, some roomies who are wondering, well, is there anything that we can do to kind of cleanse ourselves from these metals that we've ingested over the years? Somebody specifically was wondering about uh, maybe water that's been infused with silica to try to draw out the metals. What do we know as far as like cleansing the system that way? Okay, beautiful thing about your body, it's, it cleans itself. Um, you think iron is the most obvious example. Where's that iron going? It's going into your red blood cells. That's the whole reason your blood is red. Um, they have a very short half-life, uh, meaning that your body is always making red cells 
and and breaking them apart. And so your body has ways of trying to preserve some of that iron, but much of it is lost. So if let's say you have been a meat eater, it's you're 50 years old and you've been a meat eater all your life. Uh, now is the time when you stop doing that and now you are eating plants, you're getting iron in the form that nature wanted you to have. It's called non-heme iron and your body can exclude that iron if you already have plenty on board already. Unlike the heme iron in meat where your body can't exclude it, it just comes in even though it wasn't invited to the party. So bottom line is your body will clean itself. There's no need to do a special cleanse or do those kinds of things. And the, the idea is to get on as healthful a diet as you can right now. Add the exercise to it to the extent you are able. And that's really the best regimen. There it is. So uh, the question at the top was, how effective uh, are these vaccines? With the research, it looked anywhere between 20 to 40 percent, depending on the frequency that you get it. Uh, but then also in your estimation, Dr. Barnard, and on both sides, uh, even the researchers who participated in these studies say more research is needed. But in your estimation, you do the, the lifestyle factors, the diet factors, getting enough sleep, exercise, mitigate that risk regardless of genetics somewhere in the ballpark of 70 to 80 percent again more research is needed so that's we're heavily couching that statement but that's pretty promising findings there so i'm really glad that we had this conversation today especially as it's happening in alzheimer's awareness month dr barner and more data are coming out all the time so stay tuned uh we already have these really tantalizing links uh maybe the final thing that i that i should mention uh let's say a person says all right you convinced me I wasn't going to get the flu vaccine, but now I will. If you go to your local uh, drugstore or grocery store where they might be having these, these vaccines, you can ask for the vaccine that does not have any animal products in it. For example, that one, of the, one of the brands is called Flublock, F-L-U-B-L-O-K, and it's made, it's, it's a vegan vaccine, no animal products at all. And you might think, well, why would they do that? And the reason they do that is the others are made on eggs. People have egg allergies and they cannot have that kind of vaccine. So flu block is one that doesn't have any animal products in them. And you, you'll find analogous uh, other products as well. Let's do a hard shift here and talk about uh, what just happened over in National Harbor, just a stone's throw from the nation's capital. And uh, Dr. Barnard, a uh, headline here out of the AMA meeting, which you just attended. Uh, this comes to us from uh, MedPage today. It says, AMA supports tighter restrictions to curb pollution from industrialized farms. Concentrated animal feeding operations, quote, may be a public health hazard. Uh, talking about CAFOs there, you obviously uh, were at the conference. How big of a debate was this? I'm actually surprised to see this headline pleasantly. Uh, it was a big debate, um, but I'm happy to say that the people sticking up for <laughs> concentrated animal feeding operations were a, a, a shrinking number. And uh, I got to uh, take my hat off to the medical students. It was the medical students section that brought this forward. And what they were saying is that these uh, factory farms, chickens, pigs, cows, and nowadays fish as well, uh, are apart from being cruel and apart from being really bad for your health, that they are really, really polluting. And they are. Uh, anybody who lives near a pig farm in North Carolina, your property values reflect the fact that nobody wants to be there. It's totally unhealthy in a variety of ways. Plus, it makes meat cheaper. It makes milk cheaper. And that increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. What the medical students were upset about was all of those things, plus the fact that these factory farms seem to be getting favors. The EPA will look after an industrial polluter, but turn a blind eye, or they may even give exemptions to an agricultural polluter. The student said, it's time for that to stop. They proposed this. I'm, I'm happy to tell you that I got a chance to speak uh, strongly for them. And the, the entire House of Delegates unanimously approved uh, this proposal. Yeah, uh, you spoke shortly after, um, I believe it was a doctor out of Texas uh, who spoke up in favor of CAFOs. They'd quote, and this is from the MedPage Today article, so they, they have the exact quote here. It says, just remember that because of CAFOs, milk production has doubled, meat production has tripled, and chicken production has 
quadrupled, to which your response, as you already said, was spot on. Said, yeah, milk is cheaper, chicken is much cheaper, steak is much cheaper. But what comes with all of that, Dr. Barnard? Cholesterol is cheaper. <laughs> Saturated fat is cheaper. It's easier than ever to get heart disease. Um, the very fact that we're subsidizing these unhealthy foods is not a benefit. The fact that you have make really unhelpful foods cheap and affordable for everybody, that's part of the problem. And uh, apart from the fact that you've got uh, cheap, uh, unhealthy foods, you've got a, about 80 million or more cattle in the United States for dairy and for meat. Every cow is as big as a sofa. If you put all of them on one side of the balance and all the humans on the other side of the balance, they outweigh us. Each cow is belching methane constantly. It's a greenhouse chemical that is worse than CO2 by far. Um, and we're, we're not trying to stop that, uh, uh, we as a country, we're subsidizing it by our governmental policies. And it's time for us to do a 180 on that and realize this is not helping. It's not helping those cows not helping the environment that's not helping your coronary arteries but most importantly it is doing nothing to help your children the next generation is at huge risk because our generation is turning a blind eye to these risks the planet is changing it's changing at least as fast as we predicted probably faster if we're going to put the brakes on climate change and these other destructive processes the time is now and with so many, in, in a lot of these cases, we're just talking thousands and thousands of animals really in a small-ish area, uh, even though these CAFOs are quite large. I mean, you, you talk about crammed quarters. That's why they call them concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, I would imagine with all of that close proximity that animals have to one another, that really has to also increase the risk of the potential of another pandemic, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. In fact, the pandemics that we have had, influenza is, this is a bird virus. If people had not been keeping flocks of birds to slaughter for, for meat, we wouldn't have had this issue. And if you could look inside any chicken farm, including the ones that pretend to be free range and so forth, believe me, the chickens are not running out over the hillside. Um, they're still crammed, reasonably crammed together in a, in a, in a terrible way. Um, it's enough to make any person with a, a half a conscience to just you know, pick a healthy food instead. So all of these, whether it's a chicken farm, fish farms, uh, farms for pigs or farms for cattle, um, they're all equally horrible for the animals and polluting for the environment. And let's wrap up by answering this question. You know, I think that because of the circles that we run in, we hear the, the three letters, AMA, you're like, holy Moses, that's a big deal. Um, the average person, probably the AMA, not necessarily on their radar. But when you have an organization that has that much clout, how big of a ripple effect does this resolution have the potential to have? Well, I think it, it's, a, it's an enormous step forward. Uh, in the past, I have to say a generation ago, we thought of the AMA as being sort of on the wrong side of a lot of these issues, focusing not nearly enough on social issues. Um, but I, I'm happy to say that the American Medical Association has come out more and more for uh, taking a really progressive stance in many ways. And I've, 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 I've been pleased to play a part in this. The AMA came out saying, if you're in the hospital, you should be able to get a plant-based meal. If you work in a hospital or you're visiting something, somebody in the hospital, same story. Uh, kids at school should have plant-based meals as well. And so uh, my hat is off to the to our friends at the American Medical Association for, uh, for really bringing these progressive policies. Now, for me, I am a delegate to the House of Delegates representing the, the Medical Society of the District of Columbia. And so it's, it, I'm one of the people who stands up to the microphone and argues these things, but I'm happy to see a good and helpful stance go forward. So what that means is, is that the AMA is now able to weigh in when the government is deciding what should people eat in the dietary guidelines for Americans. The American Medical Association is one of the voices that's now pushing for a healthier approach. Hey, man, I think that that is absolutely huge. And uh, as you just said, you know, now you're talking about dietary guidelines, which really do frame uh, our dietary patterns, like literally for everybody that's living in this country. And then because of, you know, who we are here in, in the States, a lot of people look to us for guidance, which means then that you're going to have that global effect. So I, I just think that it's the coolest thing in the world that this came from a group of medical students 
and quite literally these young kids are changing the world and if you look at it like that then you take a step back you're like holy moses this really is like freaking epic you know yeah it, it, it is Chuck. that said um as our good friend kim williams so the most wonderful cardiologist in the world has has, has often said what's the number one cause of death of cardiologists it's cardiac disease meaning that doctors have one other thing they got to do in addition to advocating for healthier food policies they got to look at their own diet too so doctor heal thyself our work is not yet done Dr. Heal Thyself. Yeah, I love me some Kim Williams. That's the man right there. Love me some yeah. Kim Williams. We got to get him back on the show sometime soon. Uh, I'll, you tell you, I'll tell you something else I'm really excited about, Dr. Barnard, is we just announced this last week at the show with the Esselstyns in Washington, D.C., and that's our brand new exam room VIP program. So our super exam roomies that love the show and they join us every Wednesday or they download the podcast every Thursday. It's appointment viewing, it's appointment listening, and they really want Want to raise those health IQs. Well, as an exam room VIP, we are going to give you exclusive access to do that weeks earlier than anybody else. And it begins next Monday, November 20th, two weeks before this will be released to anybody else. Our exam room VIPs, Dr. Barnard, will get early access to an interview with the one and only Dr. Michael Greger, going to take you inside the pages of his new book, How Not to Age. Before it even hits store shelves, you're going to get the inside story. And one of the things that I loved about this conversation was hearing Dr. Greger explain just how much the editor kind of freaked out when he turned in this this, I mean, encyclopedia volumes worth of research. They were like, we just can't publish a million page book. You're going to have to trim this down. And the way Dr. Greger was like, well, that's okay. We'll do that. But this research, this years and years of research, not going to go to waste. We're still going to bring this to the people too. So we get the inside story on how he's still getting all of that out there. And of course, his great aunt Pearl, who he dedicated the book to just a fascinating conversation. And so Dr. Barnard, our exam room, VIPs get early access to that and you can sign up right now. I hope that you have exam room of VIPs, <laughs> pcrm.org slash exam room VIP. And here's the best part though. Uh, obviously you get the, the perks like the early access to the interviews, exclusive events you and I are going to be doing here in the future as well for VIPs. But every dollar that's raised also doesn't just go to support the exam room. It goes to support all of our efforts as a whole uh, as an organization at the Physicians Committee, including this groundbreaking research that Dr. Kaliova and her team work on tirelessly just down the hall, literally from where you're sitting right now. That is a win-win for everybody in my eyes, sir. It certainly is. And by the way, when we do research studies, um, we're, we're not silent about them. We publish these findings in medical journals. And just yesterday, Dr. Kaliova was in San Diego at a huge rheumatology conference where they wanted to know about the studies that we had published on diet and rheumatologic disease, rheumatoid arthritis. And she had a huge crowd there. So we're getting the word out. And I want to thank everybody who supported the research that we've been doing over the years and that we're continuing to do. That's it. PCRM.org slash exam room VIP. Go ahead and sign up. There's a link for that in the show description and in the episode notes. And I also want to finish up today by saying a huge thank you, Dr. Barnard, to our friends at the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their continued support of the exam room and the physicians committee. And, you know, the thing, and we say this every single time you're on the show that I just admire so much about the Ryder Fund is the way that Allison and the team there are carrying on the love that Greg had for animals in so many ways, promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse, and then also emphasizing programs that promote systemic change to help everybody who is inhabiting this earth right now. And you can learn more about all that they are up to at the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund website, which is GregoryRyderFund.org. You see that on your screen right there, GregoryRyderFund.org. Again, a link to that is also in the episode notes. I mean, they're right up there with us in my book, Dr. Barnard. They're right there. They're doing such great things. They certainly are. I mean, Greg had such a warm heart, such a compassionate person, and Allison is carrying that work forward so beautifully. 
All right. And you, sir, have done such a beautiful job today of explaining all of this research and bringing forth this wisdom and the exciting findings about what's going on at the AMA meeting. So thank you so very much for being here, my friend. A pleasure as always. Thank you, Chuck. And to the crew behind the scenes, thank you guys for helping to make the magic happen. And to the exam roomies, thanks for hanging out, asking such wonderful questions, and raising your health IQs with us. Next up on the program, we are going to be releasing the episode that we taped with the Esselstyns last week in D.C. So the big night with the Esselstyns, that's coming up Monday on YouTube, the podcast on Tuesday. So make sure that you like us wherever it is that you get your shows, whether you're watching, whether you're downloading, doesn't matter. Just make sure that you set your calendar make sure that you like and subscribe and follow so you can raise your health iqs as soon as we put that out there for you and for everybody here at the physicians committee i am the weight loss champion chuck carroll thanks so very much for watching and as always keep it plant-based <laughs>